The southeastern deserts of Navisgain contain many hazards, many treasures, and many secrets. But today, we're going to be diving into something that is none of those things. Well, except maybe a hazard. But more importantly, today, we glimpse into the lives of those who dwelled in Navisgain before the bombs fell, before the epidemic flash flooded across the county. Today, we're going to learn the story of Deshang Tower. And that story only gets more and more interesting the further we head up. Welcome to Episode 7 of the Untold Stories of Navisgain. In this series, we're going to explore and dissect the most interesting places in the default setting of Seven Days to Die. From mountaintop mansions to fortified factories, we're going to learn the stories of those who didn't make it. Boy, am I excited for this one. This should be a longer video for sure, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you for all of the wonderful comments and various forms of support you guys have shown for previous stories of Navis Game videos. Uh, whether you're watching because you're super into Seven Days to Die, or because these somehow help you fall asleep or something, I appreciate you all. Anyway, on with the video. Deshang Tower is something of a jewel in Navisgain. In a county littered with modest homes and relatively small shopping centers, a 13-story commercial building seems a big deal. It probably was, at one point, but now its main features include massive piles of rubble, hordes of zombies, and structural damage visible from miles away. However, while business certainly is no longer booming, there are still stories for us to discover. So let's go find them. Starting from the entrance, we can already begin developing a picture of what this area used to be like. A bustling Dishong Tower, a popular park, Higashi Pharmaceuticals, an entirely new tower under construction, other small businesses, and probably not nearly enough parking. The business center that was the city of departure was probably rather important to Navisgain County. This thought is quickly reinforced by the sandbags set up above, visible from the street. Somebody tried defending this tower. Let's step inside and see what they were trying to protect. On the first floor, apart from the very expected zombies, we have some sort of check-in slash central desk. Within this area, there are also cozy lounges and a small cafe. Here, those visiting or working within the tower could take a seat, have a lunch or a latte, wait for their date that may or may not show up, and sit pretending to be on their phones but secretly people watching. The damage visible from outside is also very apparent within. Piles of rubble that were once floors and ceiling decorate the entire first floor. Intentional views up to the second floor and unexpected views up to the third are aplenty. The stairwell that appears to have once sprawled the entire tower is very much out of order, at least here, so we'll have to take the main stairway up to the second floor and improvise from there. The second floor is very much an extension of the first, with slightly more private sitting areas and lounges and even a cute little bookstore. One could probably once purchase a brief pamphlet describing the history of Dishong Tower and the surrounding area, things to do and businesses to visit here. Now all that's left are the reanimated corpses of businessmen still in their suits, which begs a lot of questions about the nature of the zombie epidemic, and a row of zombified vultures who have made these busted windows their home. The stairs on the second floor are in even worse condition than below, so we'll have to carefully climb, or recklessly parkour, our way up to the third floor via rusted bars in this non-functional elevator shaft. Up here on the third floor, we gain some insight into what this tower once was, as well as what it became. There are a number of noteworthy features here. Sections of the floor labeled A, B, C, D, 1, and 2 to start. The lettered areas are four rooms of cubicles on each corner of the building. Each room boasts a large hole in the wall, damage caused presumably by zombies over an extended period of time, and the zombified remains of the people who once worked in these rooms. Once again, the fact that these people are still in their work attire, still here, trapped in their offices, it begs many questions about the nature of the epidemic and the order of events. Were these people trapped here when some authority made an order to shelter in place? Did the zombie apocalypse happen so suddenly these people had no time to react? Or are these just the deniers, people who believe the epidemic was fake news? It's hard to say, and may become its own video eventually. The rooms labeled 1 and 2 are connected conference rooms, with a large curtain in the center of the room to provide an absolute minimum level of privacy for important business meetings that absolutely could have been an email. It appears one meeting lasted so long, the participants all collapsed and Oh, no, sorry, those are also just zombies. Through a nearby busted window, though, we can find something interesting. Military personnel hunkered behind aforementioned sandbags, surrounding a crate of weapons and ammunition. 
These appear to be proper soldiers, military personnel, so what are they doing here? Were a handful of soldiers sent to guard the entirety of Dishong? Or are these some of the last holdouts from a long battle against an onslaught of the undead? Based on how they're slumped over, it almost seems as though they fought to the point of absolute exhaustion, eventually, somehow, succumbing to the zombieism themselves. More questions about how the zombie virus truly works. For another time. For now, let's let them rest. On the other side of the building, still on the third floor though, we'll find what remains of what must have once been a very quaint cafe or even a lounge of some sort. These zombies aren't in very formal attire, which leads me to believe this area was the former. There's one last detail worthy of discussion here before we move on to the fourth floor. This is actually the first floor we can find real signs of struggle, of survival and defenses against the zombies. Here we see a row of barbed wire, spike traps, and even a couple of makeshift landmines. They do seem to line the edge of a floor collapse, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Based on the state and position of this corpse, I think it's actually a fair guess that this spot was once a strong front line of some sort. With the zombie accessible stairs nearby, survivors and soldiers together probably laid their traps here. When the floor had taken too much of a beating via explosives, however, it collapsed, and this corpse flung to the side, inaccessible from the rest of the floor, is among the last evidence of such a defense. With that, let's make our way up to the fourth floor. These stairs are still very inoperable, but there are several floor collapses we can shimmy our way up. Let's head up this one. The fourth floor is very reminiscent of the third, except where before we had specific corner offices and designated spaces for rent, here we'll find rows upon rows of cubicles and variously sized office spaces meant to melt your brain. Once again, we find many people, zombies, still hunkered in their workspaces, though it seems whatever relief they must have been waiting for never came. At least, not enough of it. Though it does seem that a similar defense to what we saw downstairs was mounted here as well. Even more barbed wire and spikes can be found still manning their posts, but for one reason or another, they weren't quite enough to save the occupants on this floor. In the bathrooms, the kitchen, the cubicles, zombies roam. Or slump. Or stand. This does beg yet another question about the nature of zombies in the Seven Days universe. Did all of these people die here and become zombies? Or is there more to the nature of these zombies themselves? Is some muscle memory still present in their zombie states, some sort of very fleeting memory? I find it unlikely that every single one of them died precisely where they've probably spent most of the time here in their cognizant lives. You'd expect them to die in defensive positions or hiding spots or even near the last small cache of weapons and ammunition here. But no. They're mostly right where you'd expect them to be if this were a normal workday for them. Perhaps just food for thought for now. But there isn't much more to see here for now, and refreshingly the stairs are actually accessible here. Let's make our way up to the fifth floor. Immediately on the fifth floor we're greeted with a warning. Beware, in bold red lettering. Beware what? Beware of zombies? Some other danger? Did somebody actually take the time to make this amidst the apocalypse? Well, it wouldn't be the craziest thing we've seen. Taking a look around, however, that signage might actually be far less dramatic than we first thought. This entire floor was clearly still under construction when everything went down. What was meant to be here is impossible to know. Concrete and cobblestone don't tell us much. And the only crates we have to go off of are working stiff, so unless you want to hazard a guess at a hardware store, we've pretty much got nothing. The zombies here, though, are further evidence toward some kind of theory about the nature of the apocalypse. Just as zombies in suits can be found in cubicles below, those in construction and janitorial uniforms can be found here. There are no visible defenses mounted here, which is curious. But there is a clear path of busted down doors and holes in the wall we can follow that leads us most of the way around the building into one of the open elevator shafts where a ladder will take us to the sixth floor. Clamoring up, we come to the first named business in this tower of the past, Mole's Gym. This is almost certainly a reference to one Joel Hunink, I hope I pronounced that right, co-founder of the Fun Pimps, the developers that created Seven Days to Die for those who may not be aware. Joel, aside from having a magnificent beard, is an avid weightlifter and boy does he let the internet know it. I just realized that, that sounds like a dig, it's not a dig, this dude is just jacked, like brag away king, holy shit. 
where was I? Oh, right, Mole's Gym. Joel actually goes by Mad Mole on the Seven Days to Die community forums and probably elsewhere, so we've stumbled upon his very own gym in Navisgain. A neat touch. This gym features a swimming pool, complete with funky physics and a diving board, cardio equipment, weight training equipment, and a yoga room. Hold up. Well, there were a lot of people trapped in here. I suppose somebody was either really angry about the apocalypse or was just really passionate about their yoga. But those trapped in the yoga room weren't the only survivors up here. The entire gym, as we've seen, was occupied. Dozens of people found their final, well, unrest up here. But it does seem that those here held out for some time as well. All around the stairwell, there are fortifications and defenses set up to keep zombies out. People survived at least in the yoga room long enough to create a makeshift ladder up to the air ducts, which led to a nearby storage room. And from the storage room, we can see what is perhaps one of the loneliest casualties of Deshong Tower. This poor worker, left on his own, upon a lift, still in uniform. Though the defenses of the area surrounding the stairwell are still intact, it seems either by the same way we came in or from other damage to the building, the horde eventually found its way into each room here. Or at least close enough to infect everyone here with a zombie virus. I'd actually wager, though, that if anyone had the chance to make it out of this building alive, it may have been someone here. The entire level is actually mostly intact, and the defenses actually held up quite well. Though, given the population of zombies and the number of floors they'd have to sneak down, the odds are still slim. Perhaps the number of already infected yet to turn into zombies was just too high here. With that being said, let's continue our way up. The stairs are still intact in this area. On the seventh floor, we'll find a somewhat pleasant surprise. A richly furnished and quite spacious restaurant, complete with a stage for entertainment. This must have been a pretty nice place. It's called QZO. What that means, I, I have no idea. It seems mysterious acronyms and initialisms are a bit of a favorite of the fun pimps, as this isn't the first time this has happened. I tried. I mean, I really tried to figure out what this might mean, but I've got nothing. I'd love to hear any guesses in the comments as to what QZO might stand for. In lieu of any real answers then, the best I can do now is guess. Quality zombie organs. No, that's too gross. Quantifiably zany omens. No, that's dumb. Yeah, let's just move on. While there are a few possible patrons or just stranded survivors that eventually met their demise here, the majority of the Zeds within QZO appear to actually be the staff. In the kitchen, past a few now eternal employees and cooking pot landmines, we can find several large men hiding in what must have once been the freezer. This also is not the first time we've seen this. Seems a bad way to go. Probably beats being attacked by hordes of zombies though. The last interesting detail for us to find here is in the corner office, where there is further evidence of military assistance here. Several ammunition crates and a box decorate the center of this office. Perhaps this was some sort of staging area? Get it? Staging? Sorry. Perhaps this was some sort of staging area for the military personnel who arrived to help protect the building. Seems a bit of an odd place for them to set up, though, considering their front line seemed to be several stories down toward the front of the tower. Perhaps the owners of this establishment were just quite well off and had somehow prepared for this moment or procured these supplies themselves. It's tough to say, but given the rest of the defenses, mines, and spikes, and other signs of struggle here, it's a miracle any of this equipment is left for a daring looter to take. That's about all there is to see here, other than the severe damage to the corner of the tower. Let's climb up this rubble and equipment and see what's on the 8th floor. Well, it looks like we found more construction. Truth be told, there are only a couple of things of interest here. As we wind our way through the path zombies must have once taken to ravage the area, we'll eventually get a peek at one of the bottommost layers of rubble that make up the massive damage to the corner of the tower. In the next room over, though, is quite something. An entire room is absolutely littered with improvised landmines, spikes, barbed wire fences, anything one might whip up to kill or at least hinder an incoming horde. It seems this was laid by some desperate survivors that took shelter in the next room over, who deemed this room as the most likely path zombies might take to get to them. Unfortunately for those survivors, however, with just a single crate of equipment to their name, clever or resourceful as they may have been, the horde doesn't seem to be what did them in. There are holes in the room here that I don't think zombies created. They're just too high up. Without any evidence to support the idea of zombies being able to reach these areas, 
it's most likely at least one of these survivors was, in fact, already infected, and the others never saw it coming. Making our way back into the unfinished hall, then, we'll find the elevator shaft once again, and it seems the elevator has arrived for us. Well, obviously it doesn't work, but there's a hatch and ladder we can take up. To the ninth floor we go. Here we'll find... <laughs> Shit's Law. <laughs> Shit's Law. Well, that's just a little unfortunate. Speaking above table once more, I, I don't think this is a reference to any specific law firm. There are plenty of firms with Schmitz, but unless the fun pimps really have it out for one of those in particular, this is probably just a joke about some of the fantastic names you'll see in unimaginative law firm names. Diving back into or onto the table, up here the situation is much the same as it is below. Barricades and defenses litter the area, though not as heavily as we've seen before. In fact, there are only a couple of spots up here that seem really fortified at all. With the amount of parkour and careful maneuvering we've had to do to get all the way up here, I actually find it rather unlikely any zombies of the Horde actually made it up here themselves. This leaves two most likely possibilities as I understand it. Either a few zombies made their way down here from above, which is quite possible given the wreckage that is the corner of this level, or the unfortunate souls still left here as reanimated corpses were never attacked by zombies at all. Rather, they were infected already, and it was only a matter of time until they turned in isolation. There is a small cache of weapons and ammo at the front desk, so either these people were at least somewhat prepared to defend themselves, or... well... There isn't much else to note here. Shit's Law found itself up Shit's Creek without a paddle. Let's go through this mostly open gate, perhaps where zombies made their way in from above after whatever caused the corner of this building to collapse, and make our way up to the 10th floor. It seems whoever inhabited this floor when everything went down had a bit easier a time of it. Where a cozy corner office probably once stood, a cushy chair and the remnants of a campfire now stand atop a mound of rubble. Whoever once sat here probably had plenty of time to contemplate their scenario and weren't too concerned about any zombies storming their spot. That, or they were just blissfully unaware, somehow. Either way, this cozy view of the apocalypse actually gives us a big clue as to the order of events for Tishong Tower pertaining to the survivors. This spot is nestled atop the rubble of what was once the corner of this tower. That means that the incredible structural damage occurred rather early, and probably wasn't somehow triggered by the Horde. If that's the case, it's most likely the tower was a bit of unfortunate collateral damage of the military's response to the virus-ridden masses. There are other buildings here that fared much worse in this supposed bombing of the City of Departure, and there are various large holes in the paved streets to support the idea that shelling occurred at all. Even still, the building as a whole is to this day riddled with improvised explosives. It's also very possible that the occupants of the tower used a few too many explosives in the wrong places and caused a cascading collapse from the top. As for this cozy spot, it's also possible that survivors or looters came through and set up a simple camp here well after the original occupants of the tower met their end. Many possibilities, lots of speculation, that's the name of the game here. I have my preference, we'll get to that later, but for now, you could make a solid argument for any of the aforementioned possibilities. We won't gain much ruminating on this forever though, let's see what the 10th floor proper has to offer us. Here we'll find a similar story to that of the floor below. Offices, employee facilities, business people still in their suits, trapped by the virus in their former, or depending on how you look at it, eternal place of work. It's a bit of a puzzling situation though, overall. In one office, all of the glass has been shattered. Zombies probably made their way in and did what they do best. Well, also the only thing they do, really. But in the very next office over, where the situation looks quite similar at a glance, it also seems the door has been busted down from the inside. This could support the idea that many in the tower were already knowingly or unknowingly infected with the zombie virus, and when whatever happened to cause everyone to shelter in place, it was far too late. It was only a matter of time before they turned and slaughtered anyone without the infection. As we make our way through the rest of this floor, however, we'll see the pattern continued. Sparse defenses of spikes and barbed wire, a small cache of weapons and ammunition, former people slumped over wherever they turned. We'll also discover exactly the business that occupies this floor. <laughs> Old Man Sacks. Or as I imagine the devs prefer to pronounce it, Old Man Sacks. This is obviously a play on Goldman Sachs, spelled as is shown on your screen now, a multinational investment bank and financial services company headquartered in New York City. If a parody of Goldman Sachs is here, a law firm below, and a fancy restaurant before that, 
it seems things might only get more expensive the further we go up. Let's find out for sure. Rounding just a few more corners, we'll find our way up to the 11th floor, and also discover that the southeast corner of the building isn't the only one that suffered severe damage. It appears survivors of this nightmare actually built a way up some time ago. Resourceful. There's even a torch. Still lit. But before we go up, what the hell is this toilet doing here? Like, it's on the outside of where the exterior walls of the tower used to be. Somebody put this thing here, and that <laughs> kind of just makes me happy. On that note, though, what are these beams even doing here? What what did these connect to? What, like, what structural purpose did they serve? This, this doesn't seem to match the architecture of the building at all, so... You know what? Let's not read too much into that. As we explore the 11th floor, we'll quickly find that despite being one of the most damaged sections of the building, it's also one of the most populated. Clumps and clusters of the undead litter corners, rooms, and even closets. One can guess if the density of zombies or people here were the same throughout the entire floor before the building partially collapsed, there may have been as many as 50. So what happened here? Why so many? Well, welcome to the sort of awkwardly named Tickles Medical. This was a medical facility. Zombie hordes, collateral damage from military activity, rioting, unrest, bombs, whatever it was. Day Zero must have seen people swarming this facility. And with only a handful of nurses or doctors to speak of, and eventually a few specialists from the military presumably, this place was probably completely overrun with people terrified of becoming one of the undead. This is a bit out there, but I have a thought. What if Deshong Tower was targeted by the military intentionally? What if this small medical facility was so overrun with soon-to-be zombies, somebody made the call, pushed the button? The perplexingly serious damage to the building is quite focused on the top three levels of the building, and when viewing it from afar, the damage on both sides does seem to be at least centered on the 11th floor, mostly, on Tickle's medical. Unlikely, maybe, but the defenses on this floor are quite light, whilst the damage is perhaps the heaviest. It's still very possible, though, that these explosions did come from within, from a fight for survival, but any evidence of that, if it ever existed, is long gone. These massive holes in the walls and ceilings can't tell us that story on their own. So, in the pursuit of answers, we'll continue. We'll wind our way through the holes in the walls, big and small, through the small crowds of Zeds, past the remnants of a meager defense of terrified people, until we once again find ourselves at the stairwell. These seem stable enough, so we'll head up to the 12th floor. Here we'll find another floor of stranded zombie businessmen, trapped seemingly forever in their lavishly furnished offices that have seen far better days. Skipping past the familiar sights of this tower, there are a few interesting points to this floor that are worth discussion. Firstly, I might have to take it back. The 12th floor really gives the 11th a run for its money in the most damaged contest. In fact, it seems the 13th might as well. Second, though, an interesting sign of struggle and survival. At the same collapsed area we climbed from the 10th floor to the 11th, we now find a stubborn ladder refusing to leave its post, as well as a makeshift wood fitting to the bent and corroded steel bars that still barely hold this tower together. These form a sort of perilous walkway and passage to the next floor up. Perhaps it wasn't always so perilous, it's very likely this tower or its post-apocalypse makeshift walkways haven't seen any maintenance in years. Why somebody went to such lengths to construct this, however, We'll have to find out soon. The final detail worth mentioning on this floor is what was once the foyer of Rob Burr Finance. Suddenly, I feel a bit less bad about what happened on this floor. Yes, the name is funny, but what I'm really interested in is the positioning of these sandbags. Based on the sandbags, where the soldier and hazmat-suited zombies are positioned behind them, as well as the line of spikes and wire, we have an interesting story here. Why was this position so important to them? What was being so clearly guarded here? Well, at least that bit is probably easy. People. The elevators are positioned just behind this fortification, so we can assume that these people assumed zombies wouldn't know how to work the elevators. Only survivors seeking shelter and aid would show up behind them. At least that's probably what they assumed given how open that flank is. It seemed this is where this floor made its stand against the horde. Expecting the zombies to make their way up the stairs, wade through the offices and open areas of this business, and eventually come through this entrance hopefully to be gunned down. What that tells me, however, is that there was only one secure place for the survivors being protected to be. Here. It's still unclear what exactly happened here, but what we can be fairly certain of now is that the toll of whatever it was was quite high. Speaking of quite high, we're nearly at the top. 
Let's keep our eyes up and hop across this ledge. This ladder will bring us to the 13th and final floor. The 13th floor seems to hold one last interesting and elusive story. Up here, way up here, over 100 meters, that's almost 330 feet in freedom units, is where the elite once spent an absurd amount of money per night for a nice room. It's possible these were, in fact, apartments, but given their location and small but still relatively lavish furnishings, they probably weren't. There were probably about eight or nine of them before whatever happened here. But what we are here for now isn't just any of these rooms. It isn't the scattered Zed of various backgrounds or the all-too-familiar-by-now defensive points of barbed wire and wooden spikes. What we're here for now is this room in particular. The door barricaded entirely from the outside. That's a bit perplexing. What's even more perplexing is what's inside. A kitchen stocked with all kinds of food supplies. A table covered in mounds of weapons and ammunition. Books, more weapons, a sealed crate of supplies and gear, even medical supplies in the bathroom. This is the reward the most daring survivor in Navis gain would receive for making the trek up here. But what's it all doing here? This room is sealed up tight. There are no holes in the wall. Once again, the door is barricaded from the outside. There are a few possibilities. Perhaps there was one person left here, one person deemed so important other survivors allowed them to hoard some supplies and help to barricade them inside this room. That's probably not the case though, to be honest. Perhaps then several people were holed up in here. There are extra mattresses lining the floor beside the couches. Maybe some very wealthy, very lucky, or very prepared survivors managed to seal themselves in with these supplies, but why is there so much left then? And where are they? There is one corpse in here, over by the bed. Well, half of one, anyway. But that's important, too. If there was someone holed up in here on their own that eventually... gave up, this... this, this isn't what we'd expect them to look like afterwards. This looks more like the doings of the Horde. I have an idea. Winding our way through these last lavish halls, sneaking past the slumbering dead, even stepping out onto the ledge of the building, we're able to carefully make our way to the stairwell one last time. We have access to the roof here, and it appears we aren't the only ones that made it up here. There's only one thing of note up here though, other than the zombies. This skylight, or rather this broken skylight. So this is how someone or something would have made their way into this well-stocked penthouse suite to do this person in. Here's the last problem though. If it were a person that broke in, you'd expect them to take more, unless they just had a personal vendetta against a sole survivor holed up in here and wanted nothing but revenge. If it were a zombie or zombies, where are they? Sure, if the skylight were broken, a lucky zombie could have fallen in and this is much more like the scene would expect to see after that, but the zombie would be trapped in here. We would have seen it by now, we would have found it. It could have been one or many of the various vultures we've seen as we've made our way up here, but I just find it hard to believe that some nasty birds could have taken out the most well-armed person in this entire building. All of these conclusions are arguable, but I think given what we can see here, it might be that none of them are the correct answer. I propose one last story. What if what we see here was in fact a zombie? Maybe there were multiple people, or at least one other person, holed up in here. The skylight above provided a sneaky entrance and exit, allowing someone to barricade the room from the outside before climbing their way back in from above. The people in here held out for a bit, listened to the struggles of those below and around them, but survived on their very ample stock. But eventually, one of them succumbed to the virus. They were doomed from the start. Even the wealthy couldn't escape it. So the other survivor, or survivors, did what they had to do to this poor woman. They took what they could carry and left. They climbed out to the top of the building and, well, from there it's hard to say. Maybe they made it out. Maybe they were even airlifted out. Maybe they attempted to make their way down the tower but didn't make it. Maybe they're still in Navisgain now. Maybe they're amongst the undead still in the tower. Unfortunately, the conclusion to that story is, like the answers to many questions we have about this place and Navisgain, impossible to know. If you ask me, here's how it probably went down. World War III had erupted. Amidst this, a terrible flu epidemic is sweeping the globe. Eventually, after bombs and bombs and bombs and radiation and rioting and military intervention and all of the turmoil that comes with unrest, the flu became more. The zombie apocalypse began. 
people were told via any means necessary or possible to stay where they were, shelter in place, build defenses however they could, help was on the way. So the people of Deshong Tower did everything they could. They barricaded, they crafted, they took stock, they hid. Eventually, some military aid did arrive. Soldiers took up defensive positions to save who they could, but the problem wasn't the zombies making their way in from outside. The problem was those already inside. As people succumbed to the new zombie virus and turned, one after another, the zombie population within the tower grew. Rapidly, perhaps exponentially. Each floor did what they could, but eventually all of them would fall. Matters were further complicated by excessive use of improvised explosives. The building suffered severe structural damage, and many unfortunate lives were lost due to the turmoil of the situation. Some perhaps lasted a bit longer. Some managed to hide well enough to arm themselves well enough. Perhaps some even escaped, but that's a story for another time. Either way, we're here now. Let's take a moment to appreciate the idea of those who came here before us, whether before or after the tower fell. It's a hopeless apocalypse, but we might as well enjoy the view while we've got it. Until next time, then, thanks for watching. <laughs>